today we're going to discuss geomorphology. Right, so what is geomorphology? Uh, and I'm sure somewhere along the line uh, you've heard that geomorphology is the study of the earth, uh, but it's not just one thing, it's got many things. It's like in grade 10, you did um, geomorphology, which was the structure of the earth. Um, then we did the different types of uh, rocks that we have. Uh, then we had processes like folding and faulting uh, many years ago. Some of you still did that. Um, then we did uh, we did the um, volcanoes or earthquakes and volcanoes, which everybody thoroughly enjoyed. But so that was a little bit of background on the geomorphology. So just to recap, um, paper one, uh, we're going to just show you again. On Wednesday, I said to you that paper one is made up of climatology and geomorphology. But um, I'm not going to go through the climatology. We've done that. Then we, what do we need to know in geomorphology? Number one is the concepts. Right? Um, I'd like you to take this down um, that you know exactly how it is set up. Now, um, what I have done, and I'm going to give this to Mrs. Prince I have made a form like this um, with a complete breakdown of the three main sections of geomorphology. So in the first section, uh, which has to do with the characteristics of um, the topic that we're going to do. In the second one we're going to do is the river profile. And then the last one is the management of um, the topic we're going to do. So what is the topic that we're going to concentrate in grade 12? And that is fluvial, right? So what is fluvial? Fluvial means water, right? So the topic that we're going to need to concentrate on is our concepts of rivers, okay? the types of rivers, stream patterns, okay? then longitudinal cross and a cross profile, then fluvial landforms, rejuvenation, it's a stream piracy, and then the last one is management of the drainage basin. So the next thing that we're going to do is we, unfortunately, I don't have um, a, a proper drawing here, but I'd like us to go and look at the drawing here because when I start with a, with the fluvial processes, I'd like to start off with the beginning. Where do we start with? The first thing that we need to know are the different concepts. So fluvial, it needs to start somewhere. So when we look at this that you see over here, right? Now what I'd like you to do is you've got this note in front of you. So educators, can you please just perhaps just check that they take a red pin and I always like them to use a red pin because it stands up. Now that particular line, the dotted line that you see over there, that is the watershed, right? So when we have the watershed, okay, the watershed is the highest point that separates two drainage basins. So what does that mean? What is a drainage basin? So it's that area over there. Remember, the basin is a rounded area, not rounded, a dome, but a basin. So if you can do that for me, color that in red, because 
we might ask you this in MapWork to identify the watershed on a section of the map. They will extract it, they will put it on your map with paper and they will say to you, identify the uh, watershed. Right, so before we go, or yeah, before we go any further, so where does this water come from, right? Grade 10, hydrological cycle. So the water falls from the sky and when it falls onto the earth, it does two things. Number one, it either runs off, and there you can see those little veins over there, which is actually the river, and it's got little thingies to the side. Now, those little thingies to the sides are actually called tributaries. So, that water that we get from the um, from precipitation uh, will run into this area. So this whole area surrounds this basin and that is what is called your drainage basin. So everything that comes from here is drained into that main river at B, at G, as you can see over there. Right, so what are we going to do is um, we're going to look at uh, these little lines, these thin little lines, and as we said to you, that that is your tributaries. Now, if you look at each of these points over here, right, each of these points, they actually start somewhere. So that where it starts from, that is the source of the river. In other words, source means where it starts from. So each river must have a beginning, if you can put it like that. Each river has a beginning. So that beginning is called the source. Right, so from the source, it then starts to run down and eventually all these little rivers over here join up and eventually land up out going into the sea, right? And that where it goes out into the sea, that is the mouth of the river. However, if you look at some of these rivers, for example, in C, there you have got a tributary, and there you've got a tributary. And when these two tributaries join together, right, at that particular point, there, that is called the confluence, right? So that area over there is where the two rivers meet together. Right, so let's go and we're going to do this quickly. Then we're going to say to you, um, refer to this figure. So if you can uh, educate us, if you can perhaps just help your learners there, um, we're going to do this quickly so that they can fall in there, right? A is a what? So is A, so A, but is that now one of the following things? Is it a tributary? Is it a watershed? Is it a confluence? Is it a tributary? So, okay, so A, what is that going to be, right? So A, if you look over there, that's where I said to you, we're starting with, right? It's that dotted line over there. Right. And then, in between there, in B, is that area over there. And also very interesting to see in this drawing over there. Now, if you look over there, where do we find a river? Where do we find a river? Always in a valley, right? So that's a valley, that's a valley. So what do you think this is going to be, right? It must be a high-lying area. Then, what is C, right? 
it is the beginning of something. So if I said to you, we give it a specific name. Right, then D, what is that? The two get together and it's got a specific name. And then we have that little site. What is that called? And F is the, the main river. And there we are at the C. Right, so has everybody um, found time to answer that quickly? Right, so let's see what is the answers. A is the watershed. B is the interflu. Right? Uh, and what is another name for an interflu? What is a high lying area? C is where it starts from, which is known as the source. D, okay, so we'll show you there. There is D, where the two rivers get together, and therefore you have a confluence. Then we're going to to E, and if you look at the little side streams, that is the, the tributary, or you can call it a stream. And then F, which is over there, and if you look at the river over there, that is very close to the mouth, so therefore that is the lower course of the river, as that one is the upper course, this is the lower course, and then eventually the river runs out into the sea. Okay, have a look. everybody got that? Right, so let's move on to our next one. And our next one is going to be is the rivers. Right, so if I can just, I'm going to jump back quickly to our previous slide. So, when I look at this drainage basin, the first thing that I'm going to look at, and I see that this thing, or these rivers, they actually form a pattern. So, if I am flying over a river, um, and I will see that, okay, listen, in this type of river, the pattern looks like this, and if I go to another a river in another province, the river looks differently. So, therefore, we refer to this as a stream pattern, right? And you will see this in your uh, daily notes and in your questions is that these rivers actually have a pattern. Now, this grade please take note, is important for math work because we can give this to you in math work um, and ask you to identify it. Um, and also what is important that you need to know there is um, the characteristics of this type of stream pattern. Um, so it is important that you actually know this, even though it's going to be in, it might be in your theory paper, it can also pop up in the math work section. So let's have a look at the four uh, that we have on the paper here. Right, number one is dendritic. Right, so if I look at dendritic, you will see it looks like a hand. I always say to you, it looks like a hand. So you've got your fingers and then you've got your arm over here. Now what is very important to know is that this particular um, drainage pattern is the most common. Right? Now, um, so there you can see nicely again, right? so let's have a look at the slope of this particular area. Right? So there you can see uh, how I, do I know that that's a valley? 
because the contour lines, as you can see, actually makes a V shape. So, that V shape shows to me that the water is running there. So, where is it running from? It's running from here down to there. Uh, there, down to there. But this also shows you actually two things about the water as such. So, if you look carefully, you will see that that is a dotted line. There's a dotted line which means it is non-perennial, okay? So it doesn't flow all the year. However, if I look at this, there is a solid blue line, and that one is a perennial river. So this little drawing over here tells you quite a lot, okay? The rock that it's made up of, uh, what does the landscape look like, whether I have water that or a river that runs only certain parts of the year, or it runs all the time, which brings us to a next topic that we're going to do is the type of stream flow, stream pattern, right? Take note, there is a big difference between stream flow and stream pattern. So it's like when you cut out a pattern for your dress, your trick dance dress, is a pattern, okay? It's made according to a particular pattern. So let's have a look at our next one, which is the trellis. The trellis, you can see for yourself over there, we have got a mountain and we've got a ridge, or actually more of a ridge than a mountain. And over there, you will see the water is splitting and moving down the side. Then we go to this one over here, and this is a rectangular. So you know a rectangular, it goes with angles, right? And obviously from that, uh, I'll show that to you now, it shows to you that again, that we've got very hard drop there, very hard drop over there, and this is much softer. And it also takes, and there you can see already how it is starting to develop. Uh, and this is a rectangular um, stream pattern is something that will take a long time before it develops. Right, then this one is a radial. Radial, and I know those of you who do use the map work made easy, there is uh, the there's a map in the map would make easy Tafelberg map, right? And Tafelberg map, I think it's page 82. Um, you will see that on that particular map, right? On that particular map, you will see quite a lot of this type of pattern. So radial means radial. It's going up. So if I dump water over here, right? So I put water over here, it will run that way, it will that way, it that way, and it will all congregate to the lower or the lowest point. Right. So the next thing is so this is uh, gives you a very, very good explanation of the drainage patterns. Right. So what do we need to know about the drainage patterns? We need to know the diagram, right? So I have just shown you uh, what it would look like in the uh, on the map, right? However, this is the theory part. So there we go, the dendritic, right? So it looks like a branch of a tree, uh, the angles. Uh, it come, it, the trees come in with an angle, right? And then when we have got a trellis, right? Um, then we have got the radial. And again, what I said to you that it could be a mountain there in the middle, or it could be not necessarily a mountain. It can be a mesa, or it can be a butt, 
um, or it can be even a conical hill. Right, then rectangular. Rectangular is exactly what is it? At an angle, and obviously, uh, there you can see that I spoke to you in areas where hard rock is well jointed. And that is most likely to be granite or some type of very, very hard rock. Right, then centripetal. Centripetal means going inside. Right, this is where the water actually is coming from different sources. So if you can write this down in your notes, right? So there you've got a source, there you've got a source, there you've got a source, and so forth. And all of that then eventually land up in that particular area. If you can label that, that over there can either be a lake as it is, or it can be a marsh land. Right, then deranged. You know when your mother starts saying to you, you don't put your stuff away and you don't put your stuff away and the next time mommy comes in to say, Peter, you haven't put it. And the third time your mother becomes deranged, right? And she's definitely not very happy with you. So there is no pattern. It's not normal for her to perform like that. So what does deranged mean? You can't say it belongs to anything, right? So if you will have a um, area which can be a dam, it's not a dam, it can be a little lake or an area where water has accumulated and it just, it's very random, okay? I think random explains this very easily. But then the next one and the last one that we have is parallel. In other words, parallel is where I have a hill in the middle and that hill then simply just uh, goes sideways and you will see there is specifically a ridge. Now remember in grade 11 we did homoclinal ridges and this is the type of uh, drainage pattern that we will get from that. Right, so in summary, quickly, drainage patterns is how does that drain the area? So, and each, remember that each of these drainage patterns will be in a drainage basin, right? So let's have a look at that again, the dendritic, the dendritic, Drainage basin will sit over there. Okay. That that you see over there will be the source. Source, 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 source. That that you see over there will be your tributary. Tributary, where it joins together. There you will find your confluence. Right, and that is going to be your river and eventually it comes out there. And now every single drainage pattern that you've got over here, you can go and apply those concepts that we started off with. Watershed and so forth and so forth. Okay, all right. So the next thing we're going to go to is drainage density. So what does drainage density mean? And on this photograph over here, you can see very, very clearly drainage density. Now, I would like you to do this if you want to, is what is drainage density? And the important point that I always make is, what is the difference between drainage pattern and drainage density. Right, so drainage pattern is, how does the river look like, okay? If I look at it, right, how does it look like? Does it look like a tree? Does it look like a trellis? Is it at right angles? But drainage density is, and you can please write this down, 
drainage. Drainage density is the amount of water that I will see from the top. Right? So in other words, if I was able to fly over a river, okay, from top, from its source down to its, mount, to, uh, to its mouth, and I look at this river over here, right, and now I'm flying over here and I see, oh, I've got lots and lots and lots of water over here. But as I come closer to the mouth, the visible water is actually getting less and less. Right. So here where I can see lots of water on the surface. In other words, this that you see over here is water that is not gone into the ground. Because remember, in grade 10, we said to you when water or rain falls onto the earth, it does two things. Namely, it either runs off, okay, the surface run off, or the other thing is it goes into the ground. Infiltration, right? And that infiltration is what leads to your area developing a water table. Right? And make a note of water table because we're going to be coming back to that term water table. Right. So, why in this area do I have so many little feathers or little tributaries? Right. And over here, it is, there's a lot less. Okay, so, first of all, top, okay, um, make sure that you highlight it. First of all, number one, high rainfall. In other words, if we have an area where you have perhaps area that has rain right throughout the year, right, you most likely will find that we have got this um, little tributaries coming from it. But then the next one, hard rock. Okay? So why do you think hard rock will create this dendritic pattern? Right? So hard rock, please write this down. Hard rock is difficult to erode. Right? Difficult to erode. So, water will always take the easiest way. And many, many years ago, my lecturer said to me, water is a lazy thing. We'll always choose the easiest and the shortest route. Okay, the easiest route. So, when I have got hard rock and I've had lots of rain, this water that falls over here, is going to slowly, and you can look over there, there's a little tributary, little tributary, but here the tributary has actually become bigger. So because it is hard rock, you can't just go and make this a long tributary. So those two things many, many times go hand in hand. But then also our next thing is steep slopes, right? And we know that the steeper the slope, the quicker the water, less uh, vegetation. When we do further, uh, your last section of your work is management of the water. Um, and one of the things is development, right? So if we go and we chop out all the trees in this area, maybe for all kinds of purposes, for wood, uh, forests that have been um, there, and they're using the uh, the wood for for timber and things like that. It can lead uh, that that area uh, is there's nothing to hold in, and I always say that vegetation is like a sponge. Vegetation soaks, so if it soaks the water then goes into the ground and when it goes into the ground 
it keeps the trees there. So every time you can, the water goes in, it actually protects the, the soil actually from eroding. So less vegetation, not a good thing for drainage density. Uh, obviously, um, with all this stuff that we've mentioned there, high rainfall, hard rocks, steep slope, less vegetation, it means less infiltration. So what did we say to you? Less infiltration. It's the amount of water that I see on the surface. Okay. So in this area that we see here, right, that whole area that we see over here, right, that particular area has got a high density of water. So if you look from the top, you'll see all this water on the surface. But then we go on to low density. When we look at the low density, low density, um, and and I again, if you use uh, map work made easy, and you use the top of our map, okay, the top of our map, you can see there very very nicely how your low density low density of your rivers are so so visible because you hardly see any water in that area also another thing is the top of that area for this particular map that we do is situated in a dry area which means it doesn't get rain throughout the year and therefore um, it will mostly so a lot of these lines that you will see over here will not be solid lines okay so take note of this is they will not be all solid lines it might be dotted lines which shows to you that that river is not running throughout the year then the other thing as well is softer rocks right now if we go to the Peru and we talk or we look at those areas over there you will see that your softer rocks tends to give you sandy soil right so those of us who stay around this area table view in any area you want to make a garden it's a worse thing to go and start a garden here because our sand or our soil that we have here is sandy soil right so you first of all is you will have um most of the times you take your water you put it on your plants and you look at the water and it goes it's gone where is it gone because it is sandy soil so your sandy soil allows water to infiltrate now we go back to when i said to you when we started off with the hydrological cycle how do we what does water do when it lands on the earth it either runs off or it soaks or goes in so in this particular case with a low density the softer rock which forms sa uh, with your sandy soil particles are big so it goes in there right then our next one is gentle slope right so gentle slope means if I look at a slope, you all know the difference between a slope, steep slope, steep slope, gentle slope, path, right? So when I have gentle slope, it means that the water is going to flow down and we will have um, the water won't cause any erosion and so forth. But then lots of vegetation, so the, the the water doesn't run off so it actually soaks into the ground right? remember what i said to you less vegetation water will run away lots of vegetation keeps water so when it keeps water it infiltrates so when it infiltrates you will find that remember drainage density is what do I see from the top? Okay, so 
in low density, I don't see lots of water from the top because where's all the water? The water is sitting in the ground, right? So here you can see the water, here you can't see the water. Water is underground and that is where you find that many, many times that water that goes into the ground, where does it go to? Right? Where does it go to? It actually formed to underground water and that underground water eventually forms something which is called a water table. Right? Now, here, when we had the drought, not so long ago, everybody started drilling for water. So what did we do? We got somebody to come and drill, and we drilled into the soil, and boom, there we had our water. So where did that water came, come from? That is from water that has infiltrated into the soil, right, and got to a point where it started accumulating and accumulating and accumulating and under this we had it formed this underground water right an aquifer and so then you take the drill and you drill it in there and pops your uncle and then you have your either your well point or you have a borehole Right, so I hope everybody understands high density and low density. So just to go back to the one over here. Right, so this is drainage pattern. Okay, so drainage pattern, drainage pattern, drainage pattern. Each of these have got different drainage patterns, but we take this and we now say to you which of these different patterns have got a higher river or stream density see how the two fit with it so this is the pattern right and now if you look at all of this uh, educators and learners if you look at the amount of tributaries we have over there and we look at the tributaries over here. So depending on what map you get, you can then answer, is this uh, area of high density or is this an area of low density? Right, so there we go. Drainage density, high density, low density. Again, quickly, high rainfall, hard rocks, steep slope, less vegetation, less infiltration and here at the bottom we have low rainfall softer rocks gentle rocks uh, sorry gentle slope lots of vegetation and more infiltration right so before we go on to the, the next one uh, now we're going to do a little exercise so now is the time to ask quickly if, if there are any questions um if you can, you can put it on the on the chat and then before we go off um the drainage density right so while you are looking at this okay we're going to look at this exercise over here this is a typical exercise that you will be given in an exams right so this will be asked in your theory paper. Um, this will be asked in the long questions in your um, geomorphology section, everything. So straight away, we're going to look at these two drawings and we're going to see that what are, are they asking? They're asking their drainage, drainage density, density, and drainage basin, right? Now that's why I showed you drainage density, drainage basin. So drainage pattern, okay, uh, are the same. 
Right, so now we're going to look at this area over here, right? So when I look at this drainage basin, right, and I look at this drainage basin, right? So remember we said here that that edge that you see over there is your watershed, right? That one over there is your watershed. If you can, please write this in uh, your notes that you've got so that you can identify it when you do get it in exams. Right, so the next thing we see to you, drainage pattern. Okay, so how does this look from the top? Right, so what is the pattern, right? So we see this looks like something and that looks like, but our next concept is drainage density. Drainage density is how much water can I see from above? Here, if I look at it, plenty of water. Over here, not so much water. And I've got to go back to my notes on this one over here. And I hope you can all see that. Right? Hope you can see that. And that over there is what you're going to use to answer these questions. Okay, so let's go. Have you all got out your notes over here? Right, so they say to you, dense vegetation covers the cover that prevents surface runoff. Right, so is, are we talking about A or are we talking about B? You all written that down? Okay, but now let's see if you are right. Right, so drainage basin that experience high rainfall. Okay, so when we look at high rainfall, so again, how much water do I see on the thing? So is it A or is it B? Right. Drainage basin that has mainly clay soil. Right. Now, let me give you some little bit of a clue. So if you can write this down, clay soil is very densely packed soil. Right, particles, very, very small. So, in summer, it becomes very, very dry, and it literally looks like that it cracks. That is why you don't go and build a house on clay soil, because clay has got the ability to expand and to contract. You build your house on clay soil, not so long, you will find that your house wall starts to crack. And then you've got to phone the insurance and say, listen here, you need to come and fix my house. My house is busy cracking. And the first time they're going to come and they say, what type of soil is your house built? And then they will say, oopsie, clay soil. Right. So, but that is what happens in summer. But winter is the big problem. And still, I remember when I saw played hockey, I used to go play in park, and there was like an area, and you get on the clay, and you just went zoops. So clay in winter is terrible. It becomes soggy. You take clay in winter, and you put a bucket of water on top of it, you'll see that that water will stay for a long time there. And that brings us to the term permeable, permeable and impermeable rocks. So soil, clay soil, are not a permeable type of material. So Jason, that mainly so, in other words, you're going to see the uh, water on top, so we're going to give it as A. But uh, mainly permeable rock, which means there the water falls onto the rock or soil and it goes zoops and it forms a water table 
And is that going to be A or B? Again, where do I see less water? And that one is going to be B. River that flows through a river that flows through hilly areas. Okay, so now you can see for yourself over there, right? This is all little parts over there, and that one over there. And so we're going to go um, to A there. Right. Um, then basin has porous rock with sandy soil. Okay, remember we said to you porous, sandy soil, water goes into the ground. So you don't see lots of water here. You just see these single rivers or tributaries. The water is not actually on the surface, but it's actually inside the ground. But right? that is where you're going to go and get a drill or hire somebody to come and draw water. And you might have a um, a bore, bore hole over there. Right. And then uh, our last one is a river that flows through gentle sloping land. Right? And there you're going to see that as well. Right. So there you've got your answers. And that is a typical way of how we can ask this in the exams. Okay. Right. Uh, next one that we're going to go to is stream order. So when we look at this drawing over here and we look at this over here, like in this one, we see plenty of little tributaries. So, stream order. Okay, what is a stream order? Stream order the, will tell you is in how do we classify the river in terms of the amount of water that it gets. So, stream order, now on this map, you can see very, very clearly. Right, there, you've got a tributary. There, you've got a tributary. There, you've got a river. There, you've got a tributary. And there, you've got a also a river, but it's, it's a dotted line. So it's not a river that runs throughout the year. So you've got that one over there, which is a solid blue line. And you look over there, that's a solid blue line. But this is a dotted line. That's a dotted line. And that's a dotted line. Now, just a little hint for you. One of the questions that they normally ask you in the MacBook exams, and they say to you, Indicate in which direction does this river flow? And this is something that somebody taught me many, many moons ago. It's now. And that is what everybody finds very, very difficult to say. So when they, and they say, well, where do I, where does this river go to? So let me show you a trick. So if you go to that one over there, right, so we take the river over there, right? A tributary over there and a tributary over there and you see it forms a V and that one shows you the water will be flowing in that direction. Look at the point of the V. So that one over there, right? That one, point of the V, so it's flowing that way. Right? So in other words, if we take, take each of these, all right, that one over there, it's a little bit square, but if we take each of these tributaries and rivers, go over there, so all this, right, forms a V. Got that? There's a V, and there's a V, right? and it is going down that way. So this river, this river is flowing 
in a south easterly direction now if you've got a map you most probably will see it's either southeast or south of southeast or east of southeast but this river is flowing in that direction but what gives you the clue is that v right so you always look at that v in which direction is that v going right so there you can see in that particular case it looks like it's south but it goes actually more to that direction, which turns from a southerly direction into more to a southeasterly direction. Okay, so now from this, we have identified the direction in which the river, and we need to know how much water and what order rank, you can put it like that, is this, this river actually exist. Right, so first order streams are your fingerprints, so, so it's over there, right, those single ones over there, right, and I'm sure you've practiced this at school and you've been given it, is to work out the stream order of a particular map section, right, so we're going to start off with number one, so every time where that one starts and i always say this is how you cannot go wrong and i'm going to just go back again quickly so can you see there's the source 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 so what you do is you go wherever the source is you go and you put down a number one number one number one and so you go on and you fill in all the number ones on that map right very very important is don't skip anything because by skipping one you might just throw you on the wrong path right so i've now gone and i have identified the first type of stream order also Great walls that you can just write on over there, right? If you can please take this down, is that in the stream order, there are many more stream order one than any of the other stream order numbers. I'm going to say this again, right? Very, very important is that there are many more stream orders number one than any other stream order. Right, have you got that? Okay, next thing. Okay, so what happens after number one? Number one, in, when we count, one, two, three, four, five, six. So here yeah, we're going to do exactly the same thing. Right, so one and one, there we go. Right, give me two. Now, look carefully over here. That is why I say, look at your source, which is a one and a two, right? And goes over there. And that is the important rule that you need to remember, that the higher one always overrule the lower order. So that one is number two, right? So there we have, right, the confluence. And from there to there, that is a two, okay? That is a two, a two. And this is, you need to practice this because it always comes up in, the exams they will always ask you to work on the stream order so take time and practice this so that you can see what is stream order stream order number one is not the issue it's the ones that comes after uh, number one so there you've got two right so there again one and one is two right that you will see over there is a one and a two so that would give me a two all right, so comes after two, 
we have number three, right? So on your map, you will see that I've got a two, two, and you can have as many twos as you want to, but when you take the two, you will find a three. Okay, so there we have got a three, three and a three. So what is our final answer going to be? A good fat four, right? Have we got that? So this stream order is, this particular river is a stream order four. Now, if any of you know uh, up to what is the highest stream order that you can go to, and interesting to know that the Amazon is one of the rivers with the highest stream order, and you've got time, and you're sitting at home over the weekend, and you can't watch soccer or rugby or football, and you have got a map there of the Amazon basin, and you can work it out for yourself. Did uh, Mrs. Longbottom actually give you the right information there? So that is your stream orders, which means the following is how much water is in this drainage basin. Okay. Right. There we go. So one and one gives me two. Two and two gives me three. And you can all read. So what we can do is there is that we actually see exactly how it works. So again, great rules, like I said, pull out a map, take it out and practice it because nine out of 10 times this actually counts two marks. And I, again, like I said to you the other day, I refer to these as easy marks. So you just need to know it. Um, know how to work it out, know that one and one gives me two. Where do I need to put the two? Where do I need to put the three? Where do I need to put the four? Okay, so definitely a question that will pop up. Right, so the next thing is type of. Okay, now um, in your notes, you will see, and this is something that in this note that I will ask Mrs. Prinsley to send out to you um, is the type of river. Now, before we go on to drainage density, before we go on to drainage pattern, right? the first thing that we actually need to know is the type of river we're working with. So, in other words, uh, you would remember uh, a little while or two or three slides ago, I said to you that the river um, is either perennial or it is non perennial. So, and when I say a perennial river, perennial river looks like this, right? A perennial river looks like this. Uh, a non perennial looks like this at certain times of the year, right? Now, when we look at this map, okay, when you look at this map, right, you will see that this particular area or this river that you see at B is the Orange River. Now, what do we know about the Orange River? Here in South Africa, we refer to the Orange River as a permanent river. So when we look at a permanent river, it means the following. It has, it has water throughout the year, right? Now, um, why does it have water throughout the year? Simply because of two reasons. Number one, it is, it has water it's been fed water throughout the year. So if you look at the Orange River, where does the Orange River start? It starts over here in Lesotho. Okay. 
So and that is something that you will know. Why is the fire insurance so important to us? So if you can write this down, why is the orange river so important to us? The importance is that the orange river starts in the wet area, right? Starts in the wet area, but it flows towards a dry area, right? Now, if you go and you look at that dry area, so what has the South African government done? They went and they built dams, right? So now, one of the most important is the Harit Dam, right? In the Harit River or the Orange River, as it used to know. So now we can control the water all the way. So the important thing is now, the importance of the Orange River or the Harit River is that it is providing, and take this down, it is providing water for dry areas where there wasn't water before. In other words, this whole area could now be cultivated, which has got all kinds of economic implications. For example, it provides income, job opportunities. So that is why the Orange River is so, so important to the uh, South African economy. Right. Then this one that you see here is a dry river. And you will see number two or one B. Uh, it says, so what is an episodic river? And I also want you please to write down next to it. So if you can please write down what is an episodic river and a periodic river. Okay. Now, very, very important is now a period. Okay, period. So if you can write this down for me, please. Is a period. How many periods a day? do you have in your store? So that period is 50 minutes or maybe an hour. So what does it mean in geomorphology? Period means certain time of the year. So a periodic river, right? This periodic river only flows a certain time of the river. Now this dry river that you see over here, okay, that dry river can actually be classified either as a periodic river or an episodic river. Because, like I said to you, periodic river only flows a certain time of the year. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you something that you that will help you a lot when you do math work and they ask you a question on the rainfall of that particular area. Okay, now, I want you to take your pen. So can you take out your pen? And I want you to go from the very Saldana. And what I want you to do is I want you to draw a an arrow right up to about there. So that area. Right, so what you're going to do is that. Okay, thank you to my assistant. That was so great. Right, that over there is going to be area number one. Okay, right, then your next area that you're going to get is this area up there. And that is going to be area number two. And then this whole area inside over there is going to be area number three. Okay, so why am I telling you this? Because 
when you are going to get your MacBook paper. The front of your MacBook paper these days, they actually give you a map and they show you where the location of uh, the town is. And I promise you now, wherever you're going to work, you will see that that town will roughly sit either in region number one, region number two, or region number three. But what is region number one? Region number one is the Western Cape. So, please take this down. Region number one is the Western Cape, which runs from pretty high up to over there. You know what the areas are. But what is unique about this area in terms of rainfall, which will then affect the rain, drainage density, drainage pattern, the type of river. So the rainfall determines the type of river you're going to get. So number one is the Western Cape. So Western Cape, take this down, is summers are hot and dry. Summers hot and dry. And winters, like we're having at the moment, is cold and wet. Right? Cold and wet. And also important that you write down is that this particular area gets a specific type of rain, which is called frontal or cyclonic rains. I get a blank there, right? So old people can also sometimes forget. Right, so let's move on to area number three. Area number three is the east coast of South Africa. Now, this east coast of South Africa, as you know, is mainly subtropical, which means that this area, very important, when does it get rain? Throughout the year, right? It gets rain throughout the year. Sometimes it gets frontal rains and sometimes it gets convectional rains. So, region number three, Region number three is the whole interior. Very, very, very important. Because when we did climatology, and if you go and you look at the satellite today, you will see that this whole area over here today is clear skies. Right? Clear skies, Kalahari high pressure is sitting there, but right? it's not moving. It's keeping anything from coming in. So that shows us that this particular area, now listen to me, period, period is, this period is, when does it get rain? Is the opposite to the Western Cape. So the period of rain in the interior is in summer. So what happens in winter? In winter, it is cold and dry. So those of you who come from the Transvaal will know what I'm talking about, is that this morning, if you most probably woke up there in Johannesburg, it would have been frost on the grasses and things like that. So here, we're talking about a period. When is the period? Listen, here we get rain in winter. Where do we get rain over here? We get it in summer. So that is what we refer to as a periodic river. Right, this one over here, right, this one, depending on where you are, sometimes can differ. Um, and depending on, because the Eastern Cape, or well not the Eastern Cape, but the East Coast of South Africa just receives rain throughout the year. So that is important that we know what is an episodic river, periodic river. So episode on the TV means we only see it for a certain period of time and then they take it off, right? The same with an episodic river. An episodic river normally is that they can happen anytime, anywhere, depending on this area over here. So it will come down very, very quickly and it will only be for a certain period of time. So episodic river, many, many times we'll find here in the interior of South Africa. 
And this episodic rivers are also very, very prone to flash flood, especially if you go to, uh, to Namibia. And I've seen videos where uh, you people are walking down the riverbed and it's absolutely bone, bone dry. And the next minute you just hear this roar and this massive water is coming down the river because somewhere up the river, up the river, there was actually rain, right? So that is what we refer to um, an episodic river. But right? so give evidence from the photograph to support your answer for one five. Uh, to state two physical factors that will influence the discharge of this river. So uh, we're going to give you the answers there quickly. All right. The river only flows over after a heavy rainfall and it is short duration. Right. And then I'm going to give you the following. Right, uh, give evidence uh, for your answer there. Many rocks and boulders in the river course, and you can see that over there, right? And state two physical factors that will influence the discharge or the stream flow of the river. Okay. Uh, I am going to ask you to take that down really quickly, and that is a quite an important factor uh, because this is a type of question that they like to ask. And if you can just excuse me for two minutes, I need to run somewhere. Okay, I'm back. Right. Okay. 
All right, so if we look at this quickly, uh, the discharge of the stream flow, uh, regular rainfall, uh, you all can read, but let's just make sure uh, that you spend some time and make sure that you've got all of these points. It is important. Um, again, like I said to you on Wednesday, don't or just write down two. Sometimes this can also be asked as a, a long question. So, or a paragraph question. So, um, make sure that you learn at least four or five or six so that you can um, be prepared for a paragraph question. Great. Right, so we're going to go to the next one. All right, there you can see uh, very, very nicely the river in flows throughout the year, right? Um, uh, yeah, for the permanent river that flows throughout the year, state one advantage of the river for farmers in the northwest part of South Africa, which is just what I've said to you. Okay, right now. Before we go on, I uh, wanted to um, I want to ask you to draw this for me. The following is explain why the river flows throughout the year right now. First thing that you're going to do is you're going to draw a basin like that, right? And this is going to show you the water table of a permanent river. So permanent river, permanent river, and in winter, that is your water table. Okay, so that one is winter. So your water table. Water table. Permanent river. But in summer, it's still there. In other words, Water table. So all the water that's coming from there, from there, still runs into the river, right? And that explains to you why this river flows throughout the year. However, the only thing that you will observe is that if you stay close to so it's close to this river is that in summer the water level will drop okay because there's not enough rain that's feeding it but in winter that level water level will rise again okay then when we look at a periodic uh, river right again there's your basin right so in we're going to draw our water table so there's my water table, water table, and that is going to be winter, right? So in winter, the water table is in the river. When it gets to summer, that is what happens. So the water table then drops below, so that is the summer one okay so summer water table is there so that is why you will many many times see that if you go like for instance uh paul the Bach river and you will see that there's like water so if the paul had a lot of rain that water will sort of come back into the river and it forms puddles and as summer is going on those puddles eventually disappear because the groundwater has actually become less and less. 
so they can't go into that area. And then the last one is when we do the episodic river, what you find over there is that the water table runs over there and it hardly ever goes into that area over there. Right, so that is what we need to know why the river flows throughout the year, okay? And then we said to you one advantage of this river for South African farmers in the Northwest. And I said to you, the fact is that it has now become a permanent river and it's controlled. So all the farmers over here or any institution, it depends on the Orange River, has now got water that they can do all the activities, whether it's farming, whether it is putting up a, a lodge over there um, and developing that as a holiday resort. So the Orange River has become more economically viable to the South African because we can now control the water. Okay. Right, now let's see if I can take that. Oh, got it. Right. Um, right. So, is there anything on the type of rivers that we need to do now? Um, I am just going to go through this very, very quickly. This is something that you need to remember. Okay. What is the difference between or shall I rather first say, okay, what are our four different types of rivers we get? We get number one, the permanent river. Number two, periodic river. Number three, episodic river. Period, permanent, runs throughout the year. It's got continuous water. Periodic only runs a certain time of the year, certain period of the time. It either is a summer, period or a winter period. An episodic river only runs when something spectacular is like, for instance, where we have convectional rains, for instance, the interior of South Africa. Um, and then the last one that we have is an exotic river. Right now, very interesting to know that the Orange River, even though we classify it as a permanent river, it also goes through as a exotic river. Now I always say what does exotic mean? Exotic means something flashy, right? Now, why is it exotic? Because it runs, like I said to you a little while ago, is it the, when you look at the Orange River, it starts in a wet area and it flows to a dry area. So it has got a profound influence on the area where it works from. Okay, right. There is just uh, some uh, drainage patterns, a question that we can ask you. Uh, there is uh, identify the drainage pattern with the landscape. And again, as I said, um, you, this is the kind of thing that we will ask you in map work. Right, so it's important that you compare the two things. It's not just theory, theory. So when you learn something, have your map put next to you so that you compare, that you get used to, that you practice. Practice how you can identify these different drainage patterns on it. Okay. Right, so there you've got the answers and it has been given to you. Uh, so you can see exactly where each one goes to. So there you've got your trailers, there you have got your rectangular, and there you've got your radial, which means it's all thrown out. So for instance, like that one, if you were to go uh, not to Tafelberg, and you just go to Paul, and you will see that Paul would... Um,
So when you go to poll, you most probably will see that that is the drainage pattern that we will have on poll in Arctic. Right. Then we can go through uh, again. Um, we will send you the answers uh, so that you can answer these th uh, these uh, questions. Okay. Right. So, if we now quickly recap, if you think back, we started off with um, the fluvial cycle. So, the fluvial cycle, we started off with the basin, drainage basin. So, in this drainage basin, we learned that this drainage basin that we have, okay, this drainage basin uh, has got an area where all the water starts from. And that where the area that it starts from is called the watershed. So the watershed is now over here, if we look at this over there, that over there is going to be your watershed. Now, when this watershed, it's visited that that over there is also the source of the river. Okay, so the river starts in. So the watershed splits the water. That is where the water is going to start. Right, and, and this is we just taking one of those tributaries, but we're going to run from the big, from where it starts until where it ends up in the sea. So. The first thing that we're going to do is longitudinal profile. So longitudinal means I've cut myself through the middle, right? So there we go. We cut it through the middle. So when you look at the middle, okay, you're going to see there we've got a top part, we've got a middle part, and we've got a bottom part, right? Top, middle, and lower. So, so what is the top part? Now look at the landscape over there, right? Landscape over there is steep. That's the first thing. So upper course characteristic by steep slopes. Now, if this gets asked in the exams, and for some unknown reason you can't remember, always just remember that your upper course is steep. And what happens if I have a steep slope? If I had to put anything on the steep slope, it will be moving fast, right? Whether it's a car or whether it's a trolley. And but in this particular case, we are working, working with water. So they're already great. Or you've learned something, okay? Upper course, right? Upper course is steep. And if I put water on it, it's going to run down there very quickly. So that's two things that you're ready. But one of the other ones that I need to know is that in this particular area over there, we see that downward erosion is the order of the day. So eroding, eroding, so it's making this deeper, right? And also very, very important, it makes a V shape over there. So what are the landfalls that we will find or landforms? Uh, and there you will have three different things and waterfalls, rapids and interlocking spurs or bridges and things like that. Right. Then we go to the cross section of this and like I just said to you, the valley is steep. Now something that you can write down is that when this valley, so vertical erosion is the order of the day. So vertical erosion is the order of the day and your valleys are v-shaped and when these valleys are very close together in other words that v runs like that and like that we refer to that as a gorge right and how do i spell a gorge g-o-r-g-e right gorges not gorges but a gorge, right? You can go and Google it. There's some beautiful gorges in the world, tourist uh, places where people go, especially there in Malaysia and those areas over there. But 
Then we go on to our next one, which is the middle course. And as you can see already there, okay, let's look at the landscape. It's getting, it's not as steep as this one over here, right? So which means my, then let's stick to the basics, right? Gradient, water. What is my gradient over here? It is less steep, right? It's gradual. So how's my water going to run? And my water over here is going to go slower, right? But now why is this valley or this river becoming wider and over here it is in a V shape? And the reason for it is because we have now not got vertical erosion, but we have got also got lateral erosion. So what happens over there is that uh, we, we go and right. So what we have over here in the upper course, I had vertical erosion. So now this valley erodes and erodes and erodes and it gets to an area where it can't go any further. Now, Take note, I'm saying can't go any further. That's not the right word. It actually means it's re reaching a hard rock over there. It slows down the vertical erosion. So what is now going to happen is that over here is then the softer. So what it does is it starts to erode on that side and it starts to erode on that side. So what you have now is that this thing becomes bigger and bigger and eventually you have got these caves over there and all of that collapse and all of that collapse. Can you now see how a V-shaped valley has changed to a U-shaped, oh, hot. that's a U-shape. I hope you understand that. That's a huge shape. All right. So, yeah. There we go. Right. So now you understand there. So look at over there. There's a B shape, goes to U shape. And now we get to the map. Right. Over here, you can also see look how the river is starting to change. Okay, how the river is starting to change. It's starting to becoming very windy, windy. And also we start seeing some different things over here. It's just a river, right? There's nothing else. So number one, we're going to say to you, like what is uh, the gradient in this area? Again, it's the easy marks. Gradient, gradient, gradient. Steep, gradual, almost flat. Two, water flowing fast, not so fast, very slowly. The grade 12, you've already earned yourself six marks if you had to get this. So what do I find in the upper course, waterfalls, rapids, okay? And here I see meander. So you can see that this, is it's starting to form like a snake right and when we see that shape it's called a meander all right so there we go lower course so what does it form so that thing that you see over there that landform is an oxbow lake right that that you see over there is a delta and it is amazing if you want to go and google the nile delta and you will see how amazing that is and how the deltas are actually being used with the people. Right, and then also you're going to see the marshes and sandbanks and so forth. Again, right, so uh, that one over there, our upper slope or upper course, middle course, lower course. What is my main degradation forms uh, processes. So if you can please write this down, 
in this particular one main degradation is erosion okay in this one is erosion and deposition because it's starting whereas in the lower course there is hardly any more and it is only deposition okay right so to summarize and yeah um educators and learners this is to me is a lovely summary of the longitudinal and the cross profile and everything that i've explained to you is summarized in this um in this little sheet of paper that you've been given right so cross profile okay we can ask you what are the main degradation processes you can get um Remember, we said you are easy marks. Is that steep, gradual, almost flat? How's the water going to run? Um, and uh, slower and very slow. What are my landforms that I'm going to find there, 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 and so forth. Okay, so I'm not going to spend much time on that uh, because um, that is over there. So again, map work. Right, so how do I know? Uh, this is my upper course. Right, so if we look at the Young River, we'll see steep gradient, right? There's your steep gradient. And also you will see that if you look at the, the V shape of the uh, valleys, oh, they are quite uh, tight or not narrow. Um, and you can see the, in some cases, you might see things like a um, a waterfall, you obviously will not see a rapid unless you've got a picture next to it, but there is what it looks like on a proper map of paper. But then your middle course, there you can see uh, what we said to you, it is much flatter already. Uh, you can see there is space next to it. Um, the river is starting to flow slower. Uh, there is flatter areas, so that area can be cultivated, so it's becoming a productive area. Whereas, if I can just go back quickly, if you look at this area, in the upper course of the river, there's very, very little chance of any cultivation. The only thing that this possibly can be used if we need to build a dam. So, um, that is another thing is that sometimes they ask you in the exams, uh, where do you think you will go and build a new dam, right? So obviously you're going to have to look at the slope, where it's going to be the cheapest, uh, where it is going to get the most amount of water uh, and so forth. So there you can see uh, how we use the upper course mainly for collecting water. All right, so we've done that one. Okay, now we go to the lower course. So this is important, okay? Very easy to identify. There you've got the mouth, right? This is here up the west coast, light leg. Uh, that is the mouth, right? And just a little bit of revision. What is those? Those are marine beacons. So here you've got marshes over here. There you've got your trees for a specific reason. They, um, and yeah, you can see how flat this area is. So there, if you look at the river flowing over there, right? Uh, when we look at this lower course, there you can see sandbanks, right? Again, because they can ask you in the exams to identify in map work what is that physical feature over there. Uh, and also, if you look at it, you've got the road running over there. Um, they can ask you stream channel pattern, braided stream. There's your floodplain. Uh, this is a river that starts to make like a snake, which is a meander. So, and the only reason why we can go and 
put things like a golf course over there, there's a recreation. But also very interesting to see here is that they've actually, for those of you who don't know it in Caldrop, they've actually went and made this area. They rerouted and made a canal over there and a very, very, well, not very, very, but a, a very nice residential area developed over there, which is called Port Owen. Right, so there we see what is in the lower course. Right. So now we've known that the river starts with the river basin. We have got the um, watershed, the river runs down. Okay, the river has got its source and it's got its tributaries. And when I look at it, okay, when I look at it, I will see the pattern. What does it look like, right? It's a drainage pattern. And next thing that we're going to look at is that it, I see, but in this river, I see lots of water over there, but that river, I don't see lots of water. So I see uh, that drainage pattern shows me the drainage density. So I go along this river and I see, oopsie, if I go up this river, it looks different to this part. So I realize this river, like us, we went through different stages. So a river has got its upper stage, it's got its middle stage, and it's got its lower stage. And each of these different stages have got different features, right? So like when you were young, you were beautiful, and when you get old, then you get a little bit different. So exactly the same thing happens with the river. So what is the aim of geomorphology. Earth is always trying to make everything flat, right? So whenever anything is sticking out, it wants to remove it. So when we talk about that removing, so we want to make everything flat, right? So when we have a flat area, which is this concave area, right? That is called a braided profile, okay, a braided profile. However, eventually we can't make just everything flat, right? We can't just make everything flat because otherwise we're not going to have water moving from one place to another place. So what nature does, and it's always like this, until it gets to a point where nature does something, right? And it, we will find, and that will bring us to the next one, is that a process is going to take place. But so, but before it gets to this graded, that like I said to you, is that nature wants to make everything flat, right? So what happens over there, we could perhaps have a waterfall, right? Which is a structural, or sometimes it's a barrier waterfall and that waterfall then allows the water to fall over it and it starts to eat that away, it starts to eat that away. And eventually we find there you can see, right, there it goes. So that waterfall um, and there you've got your lake eventually becomes a graded, graded profile. Right. Now, um, okay, so I want you to go through this, uh, refer to the drainage bay of station and profile and answer the questions. And I'm going to um, give you quickly the answers. Right, so if you can just uh, fall in the answers for me there quickly. Uh, name one source of water for drainage basin A, right? I'd like you to take this down because this is very important. A, refer to drainage basin and its profile in figure 1.2 and answer the questions that follow. Please take this down. Uh, number one is a rainfall or precipitation. Second one is melting snow. 
groundwater and springs and river and surface run off. Okay, I'll repeat it again. Rainfall, precipitation, melting snow, groundwater or springs, river and surface runoff. Okay, give a term that best describe B. Okay, B is the catchment area. The catchment area. The catchment area. Right, or the source. Then here we go. What we've done two or three slides to order at C. And this is where you would have to go to one and one gives me two, two and two gives me three, and therefore we will go right. Then name the fluvial feature, which is likely to form at point D. And the answer there is delta. Fluvial islands. Alluvial islands. Okay, then number five, name the process, and like I said, the degradation process. In that particular area, is it erosion, is it deposition? So when I see landforms being built, it's through deposition. Right, then the term that describes the movement of water at F is infiltration. and percolation. Right. And then one, two, seven. Please make that an NB because we can ask you the opposite. So the first thing is, give the term that describes the high line area uh, of the surrounding basin, drainage basin, and the answer is watershed. Or we can ask you in exams, explain the concept of a watershed or a drainage basin. Right, and then Number six, I'm oh, sorry, number eight, if the term that describes the lowest point which in the river will erode is a permanent base level or the ultimate base level. Right. Um, I want to go back to the following slide quickly and explain this to you. What is base level, permanent base level? Is that when we, when a river starts to, or wants to become a graded profile, it will always erode, erode, erode until it gets to a sea level. So over there, when the land is equal to sea level, that is your ultimate base level of erosion. So land can't go and erode any further because if it goes any further, it then goes underneath the sea and that causes a huge, huge problem. So nature, when earth is very close to sea level, then something happens and then it brings us up again and that brings us to our um, next process which is a uh, river rejuvenation but just quickly before we step off the uh, different landscape there you've got your fluvial your uh, oxbow lake right when this dries up it becomes a meander scar right over here you have got your meander when it is that area over there it becomes braided and then over here you have got your delta which is which brings all the water to the sea and then 
we don't have to do that, but just as a matter of interest and some useless information, you actually get different types of deltas, and some of these deltas are highly usable, some of them are not always so usable. Okay, all right, so next to the very, very important is that next to these rivers, we have the floodplain. That floodplain serves many purposes for agriculture, for development, and so forth. Okay, right, there we go to a um, to our waterfalls, right? So there you can see what a waterfall, that is what a rapid looks like, right? In, uh, many people refer to rapids as white water, and I'm sure some of you I'm sure some of you have heard of, in America, you go on white water rafting and pass your packet and a half, and you put, go all in a boat, and then you paddle down uh, one of the, the rivers. Okay, so that is what these things actually look in real life. Okay, so there you see the Oxbow Lake, right? The Oxbow Lake is when this river starts to erode at a speed and so you have this very definite curve in it, right? So when we um, see this, okay, when we, when we see this over here, right, it means that the water is going to go over there so there you're going to find that that is going to eat away right and eat away and eat away and what we're going to find is so that's what i said to you that eats away so it eats that away it eats that away so it goes this is going to form your cut bank right and that is going to form your slip bank over there so let's move on neck gets narrower so eventually what happens when the neck gets narrower this water comes down one day with one as i always say with one stump spoot and can't get its corner right so it can't it it's like when you run around the corner and you go with your feet right so then the water can't get it so all it does it goes zoom across over there so instead of going all the way like that it now just go swimming across over there. And when that Ms. happens... Ms. Longbottom, yes. sorry to bother you. Is a question from somebody okay. um, from Table View I, Ms. Akania. May, what is an alluvial island? If you can maybe later explain or now, it's up to you. What is an alluvial island? Okay, an alluvial island is um, a whole lot of sand in uh, the river. It is, a, if you take a braided stream, okay, a braided stream, and uh, instead of having many little patches of sand, right, you have a fairly big, um, if I can just have a look here. Um, can she see this uh, this uh, slide that I've got on here? Okay, so what would happen is that some of this, right? Um, actually, just wanna, can I just, I'm going to go back quickly. Yeah. Right, um, there. All right, now that is that is not an alluvial because that is marshes, but it's actually a, alluvial. It's um, salt and sand that has been deposited there, um, and that is an island as such. In comparison to a braided stream, um, if I had to go back to a braided stream, you would have in this area over here, you will have like lots of the sandbanks in the stream. That will give you a braided stream. Does that answer her question?
Right, so we, oh, am I back? Okay, right, Oxbow Lakes. Okay, so there we said to you, uh, the Oxbow Lakes, there the water is going around and gets to the, that area over there is your cut bank. So it's cutting in there, cutting in there. So what it cuts over there, it deposits over there. Right, so here we make it narrower and river goes through there and there we go. All right, so um, any questions on that section? Okay, right. Uh, again, the longitudinal, explain the term longitudinal profile. I'm going to give you the answers there quickly because I need to try and get to uh, the last one. They okay, show the slide, the river, the source of the mountain. They okay, name the temporary, ba uh, temporary base level of erosion evident. And that is your waterfall and that also is um, something that can come up, uh, draw a free hand. Okay, let's go here, waterfall. Okay, is your drawing. Okay, uh, characteristics of a almost smooth bed, concave shaped in one. Right. Uh, in a paragraph, explain this process. Okay, so uh, if you can do me a favor and just uh, write down the um, headings so that you can um, come back to this one. I just want to finish uh, and then I will come back to this particular paragraph because I think this is rather an important section to know is how do I go from there to there. Right, so put down downward erosion, headward erosion, filling of lakes, stream capacity, gradient, and stream discharge. Okay, and if we've got time, I'm going to come back to this one again, okay? Right, so rejuvenation. Why do we have rejuvenation? Is exactly what I've just been saying to you. Nature wants to make everything flat, right? So when everything is flat, something happens to have rejuvenation. So it makes it young again. So in the upper pause, the river will start flowing. Well, that is what did happen in the lower pause. So that is an old, ungraded uh, river profile. But we want, we got to a graded one, which is that means that all of that in the upper pause, it had our waterfalls, it took that away. There it became wider, this became flatter. So now we have something is, and please definition concept, I call it a definition concept. What is re a rejuvenation? Rejuvenation starts to flow faster, has renewed energy and increased erosion. But so rejuvenation is to make what is flat to make it stand out again so that the process of erosion starts again. Right, so how does that happen? So what actually creates this rejuvenation? You can't go and buy oil, you can't get a treatment, something has to happen. So take note, there's a four uh, different, or five different factors that will lead to number one, make sure that you know it. Drop in sea level, right? And that can be your many different reason. The land starts to rise, and we know that this is happening. An increase in rainfall, we know that that is happening. Uh, fast flowing tributaries. And the last one there is, and that is the important thing that you need 
to allow extreme piracy. Now, so if we look at rejuvenation, that is what it's all about, is we making the land full of bumps again, right? So we don't want a flat, we want a bumpy landscape. Because if we have a bumpy landscape, we can have water flowing faster or slower. All right. There you go. And that's something we will ask you in uh, map work. And they say to you, there's a, there is a, a waterfall there. And what sign is that of the river? And you will say to them, it is a sign of rejuvenation. Okay, so and the waterfall has all has developed because of something that one of these for five different reasons. Okay, right. Okay, features, Nick Point, features and landform over there. Okay, terrace in size, waterfall, Nick Point. So what does it look like? I always say it's important that we know that the, what does it actually look like in real life? So there we've got terraces, there we've got incised meanders, okay, the Grand Canyon, or if we go to the Fish River Canyon, Nick Point waterfalls, and we, we can do, there's some that we will send the answers to you later on. All right. Um, then the one last thing, um, and I know we are running out of time and I'm not going very fast, is this topic, stream piracy. Great tools and educators, please make sure that your learners understand the concept of stream piracy and abstraction. There is, this is very, very important, is that you understand the difference between these, uh, these two different concepts. So, headward erosion, uh, I'm not going to explain that to you because it's something that we did in grade 11, right? So, if you can run through there. But what actually is stream piracy? A pirate steals, okay? So in other words, this river is going to steal water from that river over there, right? So piracy, you steal. So that river is going to steal water from that one. How does it steal? It's going to steal it through this process. And this process is called headward erosion, right? So there. So eventually, headward erosion, and if we had some more time, I'll, I'll explain to you headward erosion again. Right? Headward erosion is, is taken that away, taken away. So this river now joins up with that river. So what we now find is that this river starts to flow in that direction. Right? So that is suddenly starts to disappear. And if it is takes a long, long time, okay, this eventually there's no water in that area. So that particular area over there where there is no water will actually get a name. Right, so let's go on quickly. So that area over there is the elbow capture. That one is the captured stream. There we go. And and this, I always like this word, misfit stream. Misfit, it doesn't fit in any way. So it's something that starts in the way and it begins somewhere and it ends. So that is what we refer to as a misfit stream. And that gap yeah, that we see over here is called a wind gap. And you can identify this very easily because you will see many, many times it's a river, but it's a dry riverbed with big boulders and stuff like that. 
which shows you that many, many moons ago, there was a river over there. Right. So the disadvantages, okay, is when something like that happens, right? So take note, water shortage, farming, fishing, recreation, and industries. Um, for that side over there, so now the water is going to that side over there. Now this area over there suddenly has got more water, so it's got fertile soil. They can do farming, and because they've got farming, they're going to get money. And if they get money, they can do up the economy. But because there's more water, there's a possibility of flooding, right? And when flooding takes place, it also goes with erosion. Right. Educators and learners, I have now gone 10 minutes over my time. Can I just say to you, um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope I could help you people. Uh, all the learners and educators, please um, feel free to speak to Mrs. Prinsloo and if there's anything I can send um, to you, I will do it on the greatest of pleasure. As I said, I will send you this. I've actually made one for um, one for climatology and one for geomorphology, and I'll ask Mrs. Uh, Prince to forward this to you. And it is a nice, like a, a psalm of fatum, a conclusion. I don't, I don't know what the right word is now, but it gives you a nice summary of everything that you do in geomorphology, so you know. When I look at this and I learn it, I know exactly this is what is uh, this is the three section. This is what I will cover under that. This is what I will cover under that and this. And so when I take this in conjunction with my notes, I know exactly. I can see the whole broader picture of what am I doing in geophonology. Best of luck for the exams and best of luck for the end of the year. Thank you very much.